All right, uh, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about um, non-parametric methods. So this is um, another uh, way to estimate the relationship between your X variables and Y variables um, that's beyond the linear regression, okay? So last week we talked we talk about uh, LOGIT um, and other classification models and that's for cases where you have the Y variable is a category uh, instead of a continuous variable. Um, so then you can just do linear regression because, um, because the variable is not a quantitative variable. Um, so today uh, we're talking about the case where you have a nonlinear relationship between X and Y. Um, so remember, this is the example from uh, the first lecture. Uh, when you're looking at the yield curve, which is a function between uh, the y variable is the interest rate, the x variable is the duration. Um, and then you have the short-term interest rates uh, all the way to the long-term interest rates. And depending on the uh, time you look at this yield curve, it may be nonlinear. So for example, this one here uh, is a nonlinear function. And for that, um, linear fun linear regression would not do a great job, right? Because uh, however you fit it, um, it will not be a very good fit. Um, and in fact, the um, the mean of the uh, error term will not be zero. So that also violates um, the um, the assumption that the mean of the error term should be zero. So that leads to biases. So what should we do here? Um, so there are several uh, ways to address this. Okay, so there are a lot of examples like this, um, like when you do option pricing. Um, so you know there is the Black Scholes formula, which is a highly nonlinear function, uh, and in reality, you may not have the prices are exactly equal to that formula, right? So uh, there's some deviation, and you may want to estimate it from the data. Um, and then, because it's a still a nonlinear function, you cannot just do linear regression. Uh, or another example where you want to estimate the y variable is um, the risk of the financial institutions um, and the x variable is the shock. So when you're doing the stress testing of the banks um, and you would have a lot of uh, x variables that are uh, indicators of the macroeconomy. Um, and in that case, uh, it will also not necessarily be a linear function. Um, so in this case, there are several things we can do here. Simplest is to just add uh, polynomials of the X, right? So you can do like uh, beta one X plus beta two X squared uh, plus, plus uh, beta three X to the third degree, et cetera. So then that will allow you to fit a nonlinear function. Um, and that is still parametric, right? Uh, so that is still called a parametric approach because you are writing Y still as a function of X. It's just a not a linear function anymore. Um, so the problem with this is, um, first of all, uh, depending on how nonlinear it is, right? So sometimes the uh, quadratic function uh, could be a good fit. Sometimes you would need a very high uh, degree to really have a good fit. And then uh, when you have a lot of X variables, you also have to like include all the interactions between the different Xs. And that would just very quickly uh, increase the number of X variables. And that's an issue, right? You could run into problems uh, like either overfitting um, or uh, your sample would not be big enough to estimate so many parameters. Um, so that's the curse of dimensionality. Um, so that's usually not the preferred approach. Um, so we could do two other things. One is uh, you already learned in previous courses, uh, you can use the machine learning methods uh, like neural network. 
Um, and the second is what we're going to talk about today. It's not exactly machine learning, but it's kind of a complement. So uh, depending on your the exact case you're looking at, sometimes uh, machine learning methods work better. Sometimes the method the methods we're talking about today works better. So um, nothing. Uh, neither is necessarily better than the other one. Um, so the methods we're talking about today, there are mainly two. First is called the kernel regression and the second is called regression splines, okay? Um, and these are non-parametric because we're not modeling Y as a function of X, as you will see later, okay? So before we talk about kernel regression, I want to introduce the concept of kernel density. Um, and once you understand this, then you can very easily understand what is a kernel regression. So what is a kernel density? It is um, a way to estimate the density. Okay, so the density is like the distribution of, of some variable. Um, and usually the easiest way to do that is to plot a histogram, right? Uh, so you would have some bars, each indicating the frequency at some value. And then uh, looking at figure will tell you what is the distribution of that variable. So um, the kernel density is kind of a smooth version of this histogram. Um, so for any continuous variable, you can uh, estimate uh, you can either do a histogram or you can uh, calculate the kernel density. Uh, so how, how exactly do we smooth it? Um, so basically uh, for each X, we're kind of calculating the density at that X. Okay, so the density is um, when you look at a very narrow region. Uh, so let's say you have this X and we are looking at from X minus half of H to X plus half of H. Okay, so X is in the middle. In the middle. So we're looking at this very narrow region um, and then we're calculating what is the probability uh, of X being in that region and then divide by the length H and that gives you the density, right? Which is the probability times uh, times the length of the region. So that's uh, this thing here, um, that's the definition of density. And then uh, the way you would calculate that is uh, for this numerator, um, is the probability of X is within this region, okay? So you just count the number of your observations that are in that region and then divide by the total number of observations and that gives you the probability and then divide by H. Okay. Um, and then you do some transformation. Uh, so you can uh, define a function of K equals to, so what this means is that K equals to one if, uh, if that value is uh, between minus 0.5 and 0.5 and it's equal to zero in other places. Okay, so if you plot this function, um, it would look like this. So you have minus uh, one half here and zero and one half here. And this K function will be zero and then it equals to one uh, for only within this region. Okay, so that's what this function looks like. And then uh, you can just rewrite what we have here to this, okay? Um, so then our density would be just equal to the sum of the K function um, for every X you calculate um, x minus x0, x0 is the, is the point we want to know the density of. 
divided by h and then divided by the total number of observations n times h. Okay, and then this is our kernel density. So, uh, so this is the math. Now let me explain uh, what is intuition. So, so what is h again? Sorry. H is what we call bandwidth. So it's the oh, okay. this region you're looking at. Yeah. You can either look at a bigger region around that X or you look at a smaller region around that X. Okay. Um, and the density, the definition is when H goes to zero. So in general, you want a pretty small H. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, so basically what this uh, density is, is uh, you take this K function for every X in your sample um, and then this K function only equals to one if uh, the X is within this X, within the region of X zero, right? So you only count, you sort of only count uh, the variables that are very close to X. Um, and then you use the number of those variables, uh, number of those observations divided by N and that gives you the probability um, of, um, of the X locating within that region. And then you divide by the length of that region. Okay, and then this K is what we call the kernel function. Um, so kernel function is basically how you weight the other observations. So here, um, this kernel function equals to one only within this region, right? So in that region, we're weighting all of the observations equally. And then outside of that region, we don't consider them at all. So that's this specific kernel function. And when, and we can also weight things differently. So this K, uh, it can be any density function. Okay, so if you look at this thing here, it's also a density function, right? So the whole area integrating is equal to one. Um, so K can also be other things. For example, it can be a normal density function. And now uh, it's very similar to before, except that we're just changing the weights a little bit differently so that we are weighting everybody. Uh, we're still weighting things that are closer to X more, uh, but also we're giving um, the X's that are far away also a little bit of weight, okay? And K is more like a knife edge function where you only give weight to uh, things inside this region, but outside of that is zero weight. So that's the kernel function. And then uh, the important thing H is the bandwidth. Um, and these are the only two things you need to estimate the kernel density. And, and this function right here is the kernel density. Um, and then you can plot that and that will just look like a smooth version of the of the histogram, okay? So here are some examples of K. You can either uh, do like an equal weight, like what we talked about, or um, this is, uh, this one here is a normal, and this one is kind of a triangular. So you still, you give the most weight to the ones that are closer um, and then less weight to uh, things that are further away. And this is another one. Um, they are all kind of similar. As, as you can see later, um, also in our exercise, that these functions that you choose doesn't matter too much, okay? Usually they will give you the very similar, um, similar results. But the thing that do matter a lot is the H, okay? And H, uh, basically that decides how smooth the function is. So when you have a very big H, you are also taking into consideration uh, the X's that are further away, 
Okay, so that sort of smoothed it more. Um, and if H is very small, you're only considering things that are very close. So that is, is less smooth. So if you plot the kernel density, uh, you can see it will be something like this. So this is when you choose the H, the bandwidth equals to one. Um, and using a normal function as the kernel function. And then when you choose a smaller bandwidth equals to 0.5, uh, and it will have more fluctuations, right? So um, it will be less smooth. And then if you choose an even smaller one uh, equals to 0.1, and then it becomes really volatile. So the bandwidth you choose really matters a lot. Um, and that that's kernel density. So basically the idea is, um, if we want to know the density at some point X, we just look at a window around that X um, and see what is the probability, which is how many observations are within that window. Um, and the bandwidth determines how big that window is. The bigger the bandwidth, the smoother your function is. Um, and then you can use the kernel density function to just weight things um, that are either in that bandwidth or outside of that bandwidth, okay? Professor, how do you decide what size bandwidth to use? Um, sorry, didn't hear it. Can you say again? How do you decide which value of H to use? How big of a bandwidth? That's a great question. Um, so different H you choose, uh, as you can see, leads to uh, very different things. Um, and in general, we want to choose the H that um, gets us closest possible to the real distribution, right? Um, and then uh, there's a rule of thumb. I actually talked about those uh, uh, for this course uh, last year, but uh, this year I'm not talking about those because those are not very theoretical and not super useful practically. Um, but for kernel regression, we'll get back to that. We'll talk about how to choose that optimal edge. Um, okay. So basically the idea is you use cross validation and you set a criteria um, and then you choose the edge to minimize, uh, to, to optimize that criteria. But shouldn't, shouldn't a bandwidth be a range rather than a point, right? It's a number. So H is a number. And when you have the number, it will look at within that range. Uh, so X plus oh, okay. H, X minus H. Yeah. Okay, so this graph, it has H equals to 0.1. This one, 0.5, et cetera. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. It's still a range, it's just uh, in the middle of the range. Yeah. All right, now let's get to the kernel regression. Um, so kernel regression, I think the concept is a little bit like, uh, I think you've seen the nearest neighbor, right? So for nearest neighbor, you just take um, a Y. Uh, for nearest neighbor, if you want to predict uh, the y of some x, then you just look at what is the y for the x that's close to that x. And then you take the average of the of the nearest neighbors. Um, so here the idea is kind of similar, except that uh, for nearest neighbor, we're looking at uh, the one that's closest, right? No matter how close or how far away they are. But here we're looking at uh, like within the bandwidth, uh, all of the axes within that bandwidth. So here's how we uh, exactly do it. So that's what we want to estimate, uh, y given x. And then uh, you have the kernel regression, which is uh, which tells you what the weight is, okay? And then um, your predicted y for that x would be a weighted average of all the other y's, 
Okay, and what is the weight? The weight will be decided by this kernel function. Okay, now let's let's say uh, we have the kernel function. Uh, equals to this uh, thing that we saw before, right? Uh, it gives equal weight to minus from what minus one half to one half. If that's the kernel function, and then uh, we're giving weight equals to one for all the axes within that range, right? And then we're giving zero weight to uh, axes outside of that range. And then the predicted y for this x would just be the average y for all the axes within that range. Okay, so that's that's the kernel regression. Um, now, if we have a different kernel function, so let's say a normal, and still it would be uh, this kernel function would be centered around. Um, around the x and also uh, your bandwidth would determine whether you have a normal function like this or you have a normal function like this, okay? Because the, uh, the bandwidth will determine the standard deviation of that normal. So let's say uh, we have a function like this and then um, you, would, you, 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 you calculate uh, the predicted y as a weighted average of all the y's Okay, so if you have one observation here, one observation here, one observation here and here. And for the observation here, the weight is equal to the density at this point, okay? Because it's for pretty far uh, away from X. So we give it a very low weight. And then for the one here, uh, this is the weight we give to that observation, okay? Um, so it's close, a little bit closer to X, so we give it a higher weight. And then this one would have a weight equals to this, and it, this one have a weight equals to this. And then we calculate the weighted average of these four observations. Okay. And for that, you can calculate for every single X, right? You don't necessarily have to um, have to have X that's in the sample, uh, even if, you don't have the x in the sample. Uh, if you want to extrapolate out of, outside of the sample, you can still do it. Like um, just have the kernel density around that x and then just calculate a weighted average of all of your y's in your sample uh, using this weight, okay? So the weight is equal to the kernel. And the kernel is always, kernel function is always bigger when you are closer to that x. And, um, the edge is also important, depends on how big weight you give uh, to things that are closer to X rather than things that are further away from X. Um, okay, so let's look at one example. Now, um, here we have this, uh, this is our data, okay? Uh, all of these dots, they are the observations and the X variable is the GDP per capita of a country. And then the Y variable is a Gini index, okay? Which is a measure of, uh, of inequality, right? So um, what this says, if, if you just do a linear regression, you can see that it's uh, kind of a negative uh, relationship, which means that um, richer countries Right, countries that have higher GDP per capita have a lower inequality, which sort of makes sense. Um, however, uh, this could be a nonlinear relationship, right? So let's say we do a kernel regression. So now the way we would do that um, is, for example, for this point eight, um, this would be the kernel density for that point, okay? And then this determines how much weight we give to all of these observations. Um, so for uh, this particular observation, okay? 
it's because it's right at eight. So we give it a very high weight. So that's sort of the weight. And then uh, for this one here, it's a little bit further from, from eight, from the value of eight. Um, so that weight, it would be here, okay? Which is about half of the weight we give to the other observation. And then you do a weighted average of all of the, all of the Y's. And then that value is just equal to this, okay? And that's our prediction for Y when X equals to eight. And then we do the same thing for six. Okay, so that's uh, the kernel density here, this guy. Um, and you also calculate the weighted average and that gives you the value of, of this. And then uh, do the same thing again for, for 10 and you can do it for every single X, okay? And then you just connect all of these predictions and that would be your predicted uh, function. Okay, so this, this line here is the predicted, uh, is the kernel regression uh, of the relationship between X and Y, okay? And now uh, you can sort of see that it's a nonlinear relationship, right? So basically uh, you have it pretty flat. So for countries that are pretty poor, uh, there's basically no relationship only for the relatively high income countries, uh, the richer that you are, the lower inequality you have. And that's when we choose the bandwidth uh, equals to 0.8, okay? Now let's try a different bandwidth. So here um, I'm choosing a smaller bandwidth equals to 0.4. So now this kernel density would look a little bit different, okay? So compared to before, it is more, um, so the peak in the middle is, is higher and then the tail is uh, thinner, which means that we give even more weight to uh, observations that are closer to the X. And then we're giving less weight to the observation that are further away from X. And that's what we do when the bandwidth is lower, okay? And then uh, you have a prediction like this. Um, and then you can also do the same for the, all the other values of X and then connect the dots. That is your prediction, okay? So if you compare this prediction with the one in the previous graph, it is less smooth, right? So that's always what happens when you have a lower bandwidth. Okay. Professor, uh, so if the bandwidth becomes very large, is it possible like this becomes like a linear regression? If the bandwidth becomes very large. I mean, like very smooth. And then it will be very, very smooth, right? So yeah, I mean, it could be closer, close to a linear function, uh, but then that wouldn't be very useful, right? So we'll, we'll talk about uh, next, just in two slides, how, what is the bandwidth that we should choose? And that is not a random decision. Uh, we should choose the bandwidth that's optimal for our purpose. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so here you have a lower bandwidth. So th this kind of becomes even more nonlinear, right? So you can see some uh, upward relationship here and then uh, really you have a big drop here and then it becomes flatter again uh, later. All right. And you can even have a, have a lower bandwidth uh, so that you can have an even more nonlinear relationship or you can have a even higher bandwidth. And as you said, it would be more uh, smooth and probably more linear. So how do we choose that optimal bandwidth? Um, so it depends on what is our objective, right? So here our objective is 
to predict y. And um, to predict y, uh, then the objective function would be the MSE, okay? So that's our old friend, uh, the mean squared error, uh, which is uh, the average of the squares of your predicted y minus the real y, okay? So basically here, we would just do a cross validation. And then for every x, uh, for every observation i, which has x i and y i. So we first um, estimate this kernel uh, regression for um, all the x's except x i. Okay, so what that's what this uh, minus i means. It means that um, everything except i. So you, it's like the leave one out um, cross validation. I don't know if you have seen that before. You should have. Yeah, right? we've seen that. Okay. Yeah, so, so then it's, that, it's the same idea as the uh, leave one out cross validation. So you estimate this kernel regression using all the x's except this xi. And then uh, that would give you a prediction uh, of, of the y. So you call that the m minus i xi. So that's your prediction. And then uh, you use the real yi to um, calculate the difference between the real yi and the predicted uh, y. And then um, you do that for every single x, right? So if you have n observations, you would do that n times. Um, and then uh, take the average divided by n. And that gives you um, the mean squared error. So the, that's the average mean squared error for all of the x's. And then um, theoretically, you can you can show that um, the MSE where you get uh, using this uh, cross validation would just be equal to that uh, smallest MSC possible, okay? Um, so there, therefore that's the way we choose, act, or we choose the bandwidth edge. Uh, we just calculate this uh, statistic, which is the average MSE for all of the X's, which is a function of H, right? And then uh, we choose the H that minimizes this uh, function. And then that is the optimal H because that's the H that um, gives us the best prediction of, of Y given X. And then if you care about standard errors, then you can uh, also do bootstrap. Okay, so that's the same idea we talked about last week. So that says in probability, um, we're approaching the mean squared error that satisfies our objective function. Yeah, so this is just a theoretical result. Um, so this is the, the smallest mean squared error possible, like using any method. And this is the one that uh, we get from the cross validation. Um, and you can show that when you have, I guess, when you have a large enough sample, these two would just be the same, which means the cross validation would just give us the best, the best edge. Thank you. Um, and in general, uh, you would choose um, when the sample is bigger, um, so that you can estimate with more precision. And then you might want to choose a smaller edge. Okay. Um, and when there's more variation in the data. Uh, like if the data is very volatile and then you would want to choose a, um, a bigger edge so that you can have a smoother function. Um, but this, uh, practically, this is how you would get it. And this may seem like a lot of computation, right? Because 
you would have to do it for every single observation. And if you have like millions of observations and then um, for every possible value of H you have to calculate a million times to get this function, right? And then to get the smallest H like best H possible you would have to do that for a lot of H. So that's really a lot of calculation, computation, right? Um, so then we have another result later in three slides that will just show that um, this equals to something um, and that will save us a lot of work. So we don't have to do it n times, we'd only have to do it once. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that in a few slides. But first, uh, let me just talk about uh, some of the extensions. So the key idea of the uh, kernel regression is really pretty simple, right? So it's basically um, like the nearest neighbor, uh, except that you're looking at within a region, a narrow region around that X, and then you are assigning weight uh, according to this kernel function. So that weight uh, gives more weight to the axes that are close to X so that uh, your predicted y would just be a weighted average of all of the y's and giving bigger weights to the, uh, to the y's of the axis that are close. And then uh, some extensions. So the first one is uh, the local linear regression where um, remember for the OLS regression, you would just minimize the yi minus b0 minus b1 x i squared, right? So that's equals to the mean squared error. So you choose the betas to minimize that. So here, um, the local linear regression is basically um, adding a weight to that uh, squared error. So we are minimizing uh, for every X, we're minimizing the weighted av average of that. Um, it's a weighted mean squared error. Okay, and that weight differs by X. And then uh, we can take that further and have this uh, local polynomial regression and minimize the weighted uh, mean squared error. But now um, our prediction is a polynomial of X. Okay. And why, why are we saying this is uh, these are the extensions of, uh, of kernel regression because although they look pretty different, um, they are actually, if uh, if you don't have anything here at all, if you just uh, say we minimize k uh, times yi equals uh, minus some constant b0, okay, and that would just be the kernel regression. Okay, because kernel regression is a weighted average of the Y, right? And that weight is de determined by K. Um, so the kernel regression is when we're minimizing the weighted uh, difference between Y and some constant. And then uh, if you extend it further, we can get the local linear regression and local polynomial uh, regression. So in Python, these are just uh, different functions, uh, one line of code, but uh, under that code, this is what it's doing. And um, these are all minimization problems and it's very hard to, for humans to, ser to solve, but uh, it's actually very easy for computers. Okay, and that's because all of these functions that I've shown, the kernel regression, uh, the local linear regression and the local polynomial regression, they are all in the, this class 
of functions called linear smoother. And what is a linear smoother? It is for a value of x, my prediction of the y is a weighted average of all of the y's, okay? And that weight is a function of x. So for a kernel regression, uh, this weight is just equal to this kernel function, right? And then uh, for these two, the weights equals to other things, but they can all be written um, in this form. So all of these are linear smoothers. And for linear smoothers, we have a great thing that uh, this cross-validation statistic that we just talked about, uh, where you have um, estimate the leave one out uh, prediction of uh, for this x and calculate the difference between that and the real y is just equal to um, this, okay? So what is this? You have yi minus the predicted x. Um, so notice that uh, this is not m minus i anymore, okay? This is just the m hat, which is the kernel regression you estimate using the whole data not the leave one out data. Um, and then you have in the denominator one minus the weight uh, of that X. And these two things are equal to each other. And now this simplifies things a lot for us because now we only have to do one estimation instead of N estimations, right? Before you have to like leave one out and uh, if you have n observations, you have to do it n times, but now you only have to one, estimate one time and then calculate the difference between the real y and that uh, predicted y. And then uh, for every edge, you only have to do this one calculation. Um, and then you can try out different h to find what is the optimal h. okay? So that uh, reduces the number of computations by n times. Um, and that's why uh, this would actually work. Um, and our computers can actually do it very fast. Okay, uh, so that's that's the kernel regression, which is the first uh, non-parametric method that we're going, uh, we, we are talking about today. Um, basic idea, very simple, right? It's a weighted average of all of the Y's and we give more weights to, um, to observations that are closer to X. Now, uh, the second method is called regression splines. So this is uh, a little bit different. Um, and the idea for this is kind of like a polynomial, but for polynomials, Uh, if it's a quadratic function, for example, um, it would be something like this, right? You have the X and the Y, and if it's a quadratic function, uh, it would be either convex or concave. But regression spline, the idea is also very simple. So what it does is to say, um, the quadratic function is not a good fit for all the X's. So we just fit a different quadratic function for every region, okay? So for example, if our data is like this, where it's flat and then this, and then uh, we divide the X into two regions. So this is our uh, region one, this is region two. And in region one, we can just fit a simple linear function, okay? Because it looks pretty linear in there. And then in region two, uh, this looks more like a quadratic function. So we just fit it using a convex function. Um, and by adding that additional dimension, uh, you divide the axis into many regions. And then this allows you to fit very flexible functions, okay? Without going to very high degrees because uh, as I said at the beginning, you don't want to go to very high degrees because that can um, increase your number of uh, X variables pretty quickly if you have a lot of X's, 
right? So we want to keep that degree as low as possible, quadratic or cubic function. But with this, uh, even if the function is highly nonlinear, uh, we can just divide the x into many regions and then fit a different uh, quadratic function for every region. And that still allows us to fit the function pretty well. So that's the idea. Um, so more formally, uh, it is to partition uh, the domain of x, okay, into these sub-intervals. Um, and then in every interval, you fit a different polynomial function, okay? Um, and they are uh, the same degree. It doesn't have to be the same degree, actually, um, as long as they, uh, if we do a three degree uh, regression spline, then in each, uh, in each region, it can either be a quadratic function, cubic function, or linear function, okay? As long as it doesn't go above three. And then we have this NOx, um, the breakpoints. Um, from uh, from one to k, so uh, this a to one to a to k, um, and then our function uh, can be just written as this. Okay, so you have the sum of uh, the functions in each different region. Okay, so in each different region, uh, it's a different polynomial, and that's multiplied by whether x is in that region. Okay, so in another region, uh, this thing would just be zero. Um, so you basically, this uh, is a function of, um, of K, okay? Uh, so there are like K, K plus one regions. So for every region K, this, um, this polynomial function is different. Okay, and they are up to the degree of M. And this is just a more uh, little bit technical point. It's not really uh, that important. So that um, so what this says is that in many applications, we want that to be smooth. Like if you do an option pricing and then um, we want to have uh, also have continuous derivatives. So we don't want to have some function that's like uh, this and this, then this and this, right? So that, that would be knife edge. And then at this point, there's no derivative, right? Because it's not really um, smooth at that point. Uh, so if we want to have a smooth function uh, up to a degree of M minus one, then uh, we want to choose our baseline functions like this. Um, so first uh, you have um, the x to the jth degree where j can equals to zero up to n. And then you have uh, these functions of x minus the knots um, and then only to the mth degree. Uh, and that's because if you have something uh, less than that, uh, so x minus eta l to n minus one degree, and then that will not be smooth to the n minus one uh, derivative. Okay. Um, it's fine if you don't fully get this. It's uh, more of a technical point um, that we want it to be more smooth and more continuous. Um, so that kind of restricts what are the what are the polynomials that we can fit. It cannot be any polynomial. Otherwise it would be, we would be in this case where it's not smooth, okay? And then uh, you may ask the natural question, um, how do we choose the knots and how do we choose the polynomials? Okay, these are not um, obvious, right? Um, so in the old days, you would just, uh, try out a bunch of things, okay? Um, like the natural place to put the knots would have them evenly spaced 
and then you choose a degree and then uh, sort of uh, try to fit that um, regression spline so that uh, to minimize the mean squared error. And then there is this thing called uh, Mars, and that's actually how you do how you would do the regression splines today. So this is called uh, the multivariate adaptive regression spline, short as Mars. Okay, and what this thing does is to do it iteratively. Uh, so it's kind of like the piecewise uh, regression. So in the piecewise regression, you have many variables and you want to select which are the ones that you want to include in the regression, right? And then what you do there is um, you first start with the set and then try to add in the, uh, the other X variables. And if the one that's being added uh, has a significant effect and it improves the R squared, um, and then you decide to keep that, Otherwise you don't add that. Um, and then you end up with a set of X variables that are all predictive of Y. Um, and then from there you do the pruning. So you drop uh, them, you try to drop one of them. And if the one that's being dropped does not affect the R squared too much, okay? Or uh, even makes the uh, adjusted R squared higher. And then uh, you may decide to drop it. Otherwise you keep it. So it's like an iterative approach where uh, you start with the set and then keep adding things if that's useful. And then uh, after you get uh, exhausted all of the options and then you start dropping things that are not useful. Okay, so same thing here. Oh, what happened? So uh, I think there's something something wrong with this slides here. Okay, these two slides should be different. I think it must be a mistake. Let me see if, uh, sorry about that. Okay, but, but basically I've already described to you uh, the intuition of this thing. Okay, so, um, you start with, uh, you have a whole set of uh, the polynomial functions like this. Okay, so these are your basis functions. And then um, you start with like a constant or any linear function, and then you add in the polynomials. Um, and if the one that's being added improves your prediction and you keep it, and then uh, up until you uh, try out all of the all of the polynomials, and then you drop the uh, the ones that are not useful, um, and you or you stop when the uh, m is too big, which means there are already a lot of functions in the set, or um, if you add something and that actually decreases uh, your prediction. So it's a similar idea to stepwise linear regression um, and also um, similar idea as the regression trees. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna correct this and, uh, and add back to uh, the, the, the full procedure. Okay, so it's actually missing one slide here where you have uh, you have the actual procedure. But when you do it in Python, it will actually just uh, run it pretty quickly and um, it will tell you which are the functions that you decide to keep and then um, which ones are, are pruned, okay. And then once you get that regression, uh, you get that basis functions and then you just do this uh, regression of regressing on those basis functions. And that will give you um, this regression spline where you fit a different polynomial to different regions. Um, and that would be your prediction. Okay. 
All right. So any questions about these two parts? So I have a question. If we increase the degree, as you just mentioned, the higher the degree, the more flexible of our sort of spine, right? Mm -hmm. OK. So the higher degree is not necessarily better, right? Um, it could be an uh, overfitting issue that may be. Yes. Them. Yes. Yes. If you overfit, and then you will not have a, a very good prediction anyway. So um, I think this will take all of that into account. Um, unfortunately, I'm missing the, I guess I'm missing the key part. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll add back that slide and get back to that on, on Thursday. Other questions? Okay, so now let's move on to the last part. Um, so this is not actually a uh, non-parametric method. Um, so it's a little bit different from the, the, the first two things we talked about. Um, it's not estimating y as a function of x, but rather uh, estimating a kind of a different outcome, OK? And this is called the quantile regression. And by its name, it wants to estimate what are the quantiles of the y instead of just the average y. So um, over 90% of the econometrics, you only care about the average, OK? When you do a linear regression, you would have, uh, you, you would estimate uh, the expectation of y given x, um, something like that. And, and all of the other uh, econometrics methods you would use, uh, you only care about what's the expected average y given an x. Um, and if that dependent variable is just zero or one, then you only need to know the average, right? And then you know the whole distribution. But usually you might also care that distribution. So like if you um, have one hand in the freezer and the other one on the stove, and then on average, you're feeling good, right? But not really. Um, and especially in finance, um, if you think about stock returns, you not, of course, not only care about the average, you also care about the volatility, right? Uh, the two stocks can have the same um, average return, but maybe one is much safer. And then that's, of course, a better investment. So then that's where uh, the quantile regression comes in, uh, which allows us to estimate not only the average y, but also the distribution of y as a function of x. OK, so first, uh, we have this function uh, called the conditional quantile function. So this is just the inverse function of the quantile. OK, so if, um, let's say, at quantile tau, um, the quantile is equal to x, and then uh, we have this function defined as, uh, sorry, the, 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 the conditional quantile function is, um, allows you to define what is the quantile. So if you want to know for distribution, uh, what is the value at quantile tau? So for example, the uh, 95th percentile or uh, the 50th percentile. And then uh, this tau is equal to 50% uh, or 95%. And then uh, you, you know that the F is the CDF, right? So F uh, at that value of the quantile is equal to tau. 
So then uh, if you want to know that quantile, it's just the inverse of f uh, as a function of the tau. So for example, if tau is equal to 0.5 and then uh, this f um, minus 1.5 is just equal to the median. Okay, so that's um, gives you the tau percentile. And then the way you estimate the quantile regression, it's kind of like the OLS regression. So in OLS, we, again, we minimize the mean squared error, right? So the quantile regression, uh, you also minimize something. And this thing is the rho t func rho tau function um, as a function of the difference between the actual y and the predicted y. And then uh, it's sort of important what this row function is. So this row function uh, is called a check function because it looks like a, like a check mark. So now let me try to uh, draw it here. Okay, so this is a function of u. And if u is smaller than, than zero, um, then it equals to u times one minus tau. So now let's just say that uh, tau is 0.5, so it's the median. Okay, so that equals to um, u, the absolute value of u times uh, 0.5. So it looks like this. And then uh, when u is greater than zero, that's just 0.5 times u. So it looks like this, okay. So that's uh, the function for 0.5. And then let's say, uh, 0.9, so that's the 90th percentile. And if it's smaller than zero, uh, that equals to 0.1 times the, um, let's use a different color, 0.1 times the absolute value of u. So it looks like this. Okay, so this is when tau equals to 0.5. And then uh, when u is greater than zero, it equals to 0 0.9 times u, right? So it looks like this. Or maybe even, even steeper like this. So this is tau equals to 0.9. So that's the function. Um, so then what you're minimizing is also kind of like a weighted average of the deviation um, of your real y from the predicted y. Question, Professor. Yes. Uh, what's the number one here means like in the function, the first one, the number one? Oh, that means, um, so one of you, that's the indicator function. Uh, it equals to one if, if it satisfies this criteria. So it equals to one if u is smaller than zero. It equals to zero if u is greater or equal to zero. Okay, okay got it, thanks. Uh -huh. Any other questions? So now let me uh, explain what, why do we have a function like this? Um, so this is again, a linear pro programming problem that's actually very easy for the computer to solve uh, this minimization problem right here. Uh, but why do we have something like this? Okay, so um, this row, row tau here, uh, it's just kind of like a loss function, uh, but it's different if uh, for different taus. Um, and when tau equals to 0.5, it's equally steep uh, on these two sides. And when tau equals to 0.9, it's uh, steeper for these positive parts and less steep for these negative parts. So now let's see if tau equals to 0.5, what, 
what are we minimizing, okay? So if tau equals 2.5, then uh, what we have here is rho tau, uh, sorry, rho tau u just equals to 0.5 times um, u, right? And then we are minimizing um, rho tau times 0.5 times u times y minus beta x. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, rho tau is a function of y minus beta x. So it's uh, 0.5 times uh, the absolute value of y times y minus beta x. Sorry about that. Um, so that's what I mean. What mean? Uh, what we are minimizing? Okay. And then this 0.5 doesn't matter. Um, so we're just actually minimizing the absolute deviation of the actual y from the predicted y. And what is the value that minimizes that? It's the median, okay? Right? Because if you have like five values um, and then you, ca you calculate the sum of uh, something, the sum of the deviation uh, of, uh, of all of the y's from your prediction. Um, and then only when your prediction is at the median and then that sum can be minimized. And uh, for example, let's uh, do for it another tau, let's say tau equals to 0.9. And then the row, row tau of u um, equals to here, um, Point nine um, of y minus beta x plus point one times um, y minus beta x. Um, times indicator of y smaller than beta x. Okay, this is indicator for y greater than beta x. And what this does is also the deviation, but we are weighting the negative and positive deviation differently. Um, so if the predicted um, value is smaller than y, then we put a lot of weight on that um, deviation, okay? And if it's bigger than y, uh, we put less weight, okay? So we're sort of penalizing the cases more uh, when the predicted value is lower than the actual y. So then what we would end up getting is a pretty big prediction, right? Because uh, we are penalizing more when that prediction is smaller. Um, and so we would end up just getting a higher up 
uh, point of the distribution, which is the 90th percentile. So the idea is uh, kind of penalizing uh, the negative and positive deviations differently so that you just get different percentiles of that distribution of Y. Um, if you just penalizing all the deviations equally, you would get the median. If you only um, penalize uh, positive deviations, um, you would get the minimum, okay? And if you only penalize negative, you would get the maximum. Uh, but if you do some other weights and then you can get the other percentiles. Okay, so you just solve this uh, problem. Um, and then that allows you to estimate uh, the betas for each tau, okay? And you can do it for several taus and that tells you uh, what is the predicted uh, 50th percentile of Y and 90th percentile of Y, et cetera, okay? And that's sometimes useful uh, besides just knowing what is the predicted average value of Y. So the final thing I want to talk about is um, how do we interpret this uh, quantile regression? Um, so sometimes we may talk about um, the quantile regression coefficients at the median. Um, for example, um, if we do a training program of uh, some workers and then it increases the 10th percentile of the Y by 10%. So that program is like a zero one variable. And then uh, the beta coefficient is 10% um, and tau is equal to 10% 10, uh, 10 here. So that um, you might be tempted to say that um, when you're doing the training and people are at the 10th percentile of the distribution um, increases their earnings by 10%, okay? However, that is not true because what quantile regression tells you is only how the quantiles changes, like how the distribution of Y changes. Um, and for example, if this is the distribution um, of the earnings where you don't have the training. And then uh, this is the distribution where you have the training, okay? And this is the 10th percentile here, this is 10th percentile here. Um, and you can look at this difference and say that um, the 10th percentile of the Y increases by 10%. However, this person here may not be this person here. Okay, so it may, there may be a reshuffling with, um, of the order uh, in that distribution. Okay, so this person may be moving to here um, and then some other person may become this person. So the, um, you, you can never tell what is uh, the treatment effect for every uh, individual but you can also say, you can only say that um, what is the treatment effect on this distribution of Y? How does that changes the entire distribution? Um, and in other words, the poor people uh, after the training is less poor than the poor people bef uh, before the training, but you can say it for the same poor people, whether training makes them better uh, and how much better. Okay. And because that's because uh, this is only the effects on distributions and not the actual individuals. Um, so this is a little bit different from the linear regression, right? Because linear regression, you would just say that for every person, um, having that training can on average increase your income by 10%. However, you cannot say something like that here.
Any questions? Do you find this confusing or? Okay. So it's a lot of math that we normally have, but actually the um, all the concepts are pretty straightforward, right? So kernel regression is just um, the weighted average of, uh, of the Y and depends on, uh, you wanna give more weights to, to people that are closer. And then uh, regression spline is just, you have a different polynomial for the different areas of X. And then quantile regression is you estimate the effect on the distribution of Y, uh, not only the, the mean of Y. And for all of this, I'm telling you, uh, what is the intuition of uh, how to go about estimating those? But actually, in the in Python, it's always um, several lines of code, and uh, it, it it will seem very easy. Um, okay, so that's actually all I have. So uh, if you don't mind, I can try to recover my file so that I can finish the part on Mars. Okay.
All right, so this is what we had. Um, so for this our, um, iterative approach, we want to first have um, the x variables um, that we use to predict the y. Let's say there are p variables x1 to xp. Um, and then uh, we call tj is the set of uh, observed values of each uh, xj. And then we start uh, with the basis set, just um, very simple constant function. Okay, so it's just a constant. And then in each stage, we add something to the basis set. Um, so the things we add are going to take this form. So uh, it will be hx. So hx is anything that's already in the set. Um, and then multiplied by this uh, not function. Um, so xj minus t, uh, and then a little positive sign here means that we're taking the positive part of xj minus t so that it equals to xj minus t if xj minus t is positive and equals to zero uh, if it's negative. So it will again look like a check function. And then uh, the other thing is hx times t minus xj uh, positive part, which um, again, this is equals to t minus xj if that thing is positive and equals to zero if it's negative. Okay. So we are adding these two check functions um, to this basis set. And um, so what, which ones do we choose? Uh, we choose the ones that produce the largest decrease uh, in the MSE. Um, and that's uh, the ones we're gonna add. And uh, this, set of functions is called n, okay? And this way you can add all of the polynomials you want and those polynomials uh, because it is uh, multiplied by this check function so that will only apply to certain regions, okay? Um, so for example, if you start from uh, the constant and then constant uh, can be multiplied by xj minus t, um, and then uh, if you want a quadratic, you can just use that from the previous set and then multiply it by some other, um, by some other check function. And then this will um, get you to all of, the, all of the polynomials that only applies to one region of X. And then uh, at each step, you only choose the functions that uh, minimizes uh, the MSE and then you stop when uh, you have too many functions already in this set or that uh, the de decrease uh, in this MSE is very small. Okay, so that's uh, your criteria for stopping. And then finally, um, you, you do the pruning. Um, so you can throw away things from the, um, from the basis, from the set of basis functions that are not predictive. Okay, so if you throw something away that um, residual sum of squares doesn't increase by a lot, um, and then maybe you should do that. Um, and then at the end, after you do this adding and pruning, you will end up with, um, with uh, the optimal set of functions. And then that's, um, that's the one that we're gonna use. So that's the idea of the of the Mars. Is that clear? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, so that's all I have for today. So if you uh, don't have any questions, you're 
you can feel free to leave. Um, and then on on Thursday, we're gonna do um, another exercise, just uh, trying to uh, practicing how to estimate all of these models in Python. And oh, one more thing, the um, the group exercise, I think I'm gonna start distributing this week. Um, and so if you still haven't filled out the like time zone survey on Elms, you should do that as soon as possible um, so that we can put you into the right groups. Um, that's it. So professor, you're gonna you're gonna split the group, not us, right? Yes. Okay, got it. Um, professor, for the data came courses, um, do we have to finish it before the due date you set or just finish that before our class is over? Uh, before the class is over, it's fine. Okay, yeah. and so we have to finish five course, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are those any courses or specific courses that you mentioned? No, no, it's, uh, you can pick the, the things that you, you would like to learn. Um, so it's any five out of that 10. Out of the 10, okay. Right, and yeah, if you even wanna do something else, you can suggest to me if you don't like those. Okay, thank you. That's totally up to you. Because I have a question I really wanna ask you. Um, So you, you actually mentioned previously that in linear regression, we actually assume the errors are normal. So because because we, we assume, that's our assumption so that we, we know that our beta actually could be, uh, our beta is, t, is a t-digit distribution uh, if our sample is limited. So, so in the meantime, you talk about, um, for instance, the logic, logic or private function so so that we cannot we, we, we cannot know the distribution of the beta because the, the scenario is complicated uh, my question is can you just give me more uh, intuition of that sentence that i i really want to know oh uh i mean for most of the estimators you have it's gonna be complicated um except for linear regression i guess um, so that's actually a very, that's actually an exception. 